There are some interesting challenges associated with uh, these kinds of technologies, though. Uh, one of them is if you have multiple devices, and then if more than one of them hears a question, then they both may try to respond or they may, may, may both uh, try to take an action for you. That could lead to a certain amount of confusion. You also want to be careful about con convenience uh, trumping uh, safety. So what you would not want, for instance, is someone to be able to walk up to the front door and say, unlock the house. Uh, you, you'd want to make sure that you had at least voice recognition or some other method of identifying the party and do they have the authority to ask that that action be taken. Uh, there's another uh, challenge associated with these kinds of devices and that's that they are uh, made by many different brands. And one of the things that I think a consumer would like is that everything interworks with everything else, just like on the internet. And that's going to require standardization and cooperation among the various device makers. So we, I hope we can look forward to a world where interoperation is considered a badge of utility uh, and therefore favored as opposed to uh, I've got my thing and it only works with my brand of stuff, which is how networking used to be before the internet. You don't want the webcam to accept the command from some random place in the net that says transfer the uh, video stream to me uh, without proper end-to-end -end of authentication. And so we introduce uh, strong authentication using public key crypto, for example, as a way of uh, exchanging keys and encrypting data that's, uh, that's being transported. Uh, we are also very careful about encrypting data at rest wherever it happens to be, again, so that if there is a breach, the party breaching only gets encrypted data and doesn't get uh, decrypted plain text. So a lot of those kinds of strong authentication mechanisms are very much top of mind. For, uh, for the designs of these kinds of products. And the reason that it was so successful is that they were able to find a way of rank ordering the results that responded to the search terms that you put in. And the rank ordering trick was called PageRank. Uh, the idea here was that if a website had lots of other websites pointing to it, it must be a more important website. It must be a website that has useful content. Otherwise, why would people point to it? And so they rank ordered the page responding to the search by uh, the number of, of uh, pointers to that particular page. Now, since that time, there are hundreds of other indicators that help us figure out what the ranking order should be to present results back to a searching user. But that particular technique turned out to be extremely powerful because it took advantage of the knowledge that was embedded in the World Wide Web itself uh, by way of these hyperlinks to point to web pages of interest. So I think that's really the reason that it was so popular is because it was so effective. You found stuff that you were looking for quickly and it was near the top of the list of all the things that were presented as responsive to your search terms. people started to use the term as a substitute for searching on the internet. I Googled it uh, and I confess I'm an avid Googler. I, I Google all the time because I can't even sit down and write an essay anymore without being online because I get about halfway into it and I have a bunch of questions that I need answers to and I go to Google to get them. Artificial intelligence and machine learning for speech understanding, for uh, speech recognition, for speech uh, generation or synthesis, and also translation. Uh, all of those tools have become extraordinarily powerful. Uh, at Google, we have a, one particular application uh, called Live Transcribe, which basically takes sound in on your mobile and turns it into transcripted text, and it does it in a hundred different languages. So uh, you can have a conversation with someone. It's not doing real-time translation yet, but that's uh, certainly uh, a possibility. More recently, there's been a lot of noise about the metaverse and you know 3D environments and things like that. And some who are even more excited about augmented reality, which I tend to resonate with. The idea that you can see the real world, but that information about it is being presented to you visually and perhaps audibly. Uh, is actually quite appealing when you think about someone who is visually impaired uh, or, or, or is deaf or hard of hearing. 
and needs uh, information about where are they, where are they going, you know, where is it the thing that they're looking for. Uh, that kind of uh, augmented reality can be very, very helpful. So these are two kinds of technologies that I'm excited about. So retraining uh, turns out to be a very important uh, theme. Uh, we have a major activity called Grow with Google, which is intended to help people retrain, uh, gain new skills, especially in the online programming environment. So uh, I can anticipate that there will be need for more programmers and more people who are capable of installing and configuring these uh, programmable and network devices. Uh, which says that uh, we have plenty of room for what we'll call STEM-skilled work. There are a lot of jobs that are open right now that are not filled, partly because we don't have people with sufficient training. And so that's another part of our uh, challenge, I think, in, in the society we live in today, is to remind people that there are opportunities for new kinds of work and opportunities to learn how to do those things. Uh, you know, you've heard the term lifelong learning. Imagine a child born today might live to be 100 or, or even older. Then the working career could be 60, 70, 80 years. And over that period of time, you can imagine new technologies would come along, new kinds of work would come along. You'd have to learn new things in order to stay relevant and productive. So this notion of lifelong learning is quite real. So we are living in a very, uh, I would say, vulnerable cyber environment right now. We really need to work hard to build defenses against these various kinds of uh, risk factors. Uh, and we probably need to work even harder on uh, what I'll call accountability and agency. We really need to build in a regime in which uh, people or organizations or even countries can be held accountable and identifiable uh, for uh, bad behavior. So uh, since the internet is global in scope and because the packets that flow through the net don't know when they've crossed international boundaries, a lot of these harmful uh, behaviors uh, can be visited upon a victim in one jurisdiction from a, a, an attacker in another, which means that we're going to have to come up with international agreements about how to cope with accountability. And it also means that countries will have to come to agreement about what is commonly considered to be criminal behavior or harmful behavior that justifies uh, you know, holding people to account. The term, which I'm also uh, focused on these days, is called uh, uh, agency. And here the question is, what can we do to empower people to protect themselves or organizations or even countries to protect themselves in this cyber environment? And once again, there's a technological component to it, but there's also potentially a legal uh, and uh, even ethical framework uh, that, that leads us to want to provide these protections. The irony of all this, unfortunately, is that many of the things that you and I might consider appropriate for uh, agency uh, and, and for accountability uh, can also be used to suppress freedom of speech, to track down dissidents and do other kinds of things that we might uh, not uh, consider appropriate in a democratic society, but which, are, which are very common in authoritarian societies. So once again, we have this peculiar uh, narrow uh, road to walk on where we want to introduce agency and accountability, but we don't want it to be used to suppress freedom of speech freedom uh, to hear uh, and freedom to assemble among the many other freedoms that the UN uh, Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights offers to us. I think the thing that I will be speaking about has to do with our uh, dependencies in this complex environment. As an example, the mobile has become so critical to so many different functions. We have literally millions of apps that are to choose from. Um, if it doesn't work for some reason, if you don't have a, a access to the web or uh, your battery is dead or you're in a place where you can't use the, the mobile because you're not allowed to have a radio, you suddenly find yourself uh, stuck, possibly unable to execute on something you need to do. 
for example, maybe you can't get logged into your email because you're using two-factor authentication with the mobile, that means you can't get the message that you needed to get in order to cut a deal that will save the company and the company goes bankrupt. So uh, I worry that we may be overly dependent on some of these devices and we need to spread the, the backup capability to have alternatives that uh, will serve even if a primary device isn't available. So a vulnerability to uh, dependency, I think, will be another topic. And then finally, I will spend a little bit of time just speculating about what's coming next, what, uh, what might we anticipate. And one thing I would like to speak to is the interplanetary extension of the internet, which is well underway. Uh, new protocols have been required uh, in order to deal with the low, low speed of light. Just to give you an example, going between Earth and Mars at the speed of light when we're closest together in our orbits, 35 million miles takes three and a half minutes one way. And when we're farthest apart, it's 20 minutes one way and 40 minutes round trip time. So new protocols have been needed and there's an organization that's uh, set up to uh, standardize these protocols. It's the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems made up of all the spacefaring nations of the world and the Internet Engineering Task Force. And more recently, the Interplanetary Network Special Interest Group of the Internet Society has assembled a team of people who are implementing these protocols, testing them both terrestrially and in space. So we can anticipate uh, an interplanetary backbone growing over time, especially as we see the Artemis One mission returning to the moon, the beginning of our uh, outward uh, push to get to Mars and some of the other planets in the solar system.